Sonic 1 on Master System? How do you expect me to play it? I don't even have the means to hook it up. The Game Gear? Are you serious? This thing's gonna die the moment I turn it on. I can't even afford the amount of batteries it takes to play this thing. You got me. If I beat on here, can we just move on to Sonic 2, please? Sonic 2? Sure can. So, Sonic the Hedgehog 1, the 8-bit follow-up, there's a handful of ways to play it today. Initially debuting on the Sega Master System, I would eventually get my first crack at it upon discovering there was a Sonic 1 handheld counterpart coming out for the newly released Sega Game Gear. A handheld Sonic, you say? Sign me up. There's something about bite-sized handheld games that really captivates me. Handheld games can be easy to pick up and play when you don't have a ton of time on your hands to invest in them. I can easily beat many of my Game Boy and Game Gear games in a couple of hours. As a kid, these were central for summer breaks from school when you were going away for a weekend trip, preparing for an upcoming flight or yearly road trip. Handhelds themselves can come in many shapes and sizes and depending on their capabilities would be essential for a variety of outings you would be partaking in. I for one grew up with the original Game Boy and absolutely hated the dark green olive display that came on the earlier models. They grew better over time with the likes of the Game Boy Pocket and eventually Game Boy Color release. What really kept me invested in them primarily though were their excellent catalog of games. The Game Boy in many instances was right on par with the NES and Super NES when it came to exclusivity and new releases. Yet when I laid my eyes on the new Sega Game Gear, I truly had the best of both worlds. I had my beautifully colored handheld display and at the same time had one of my favorite characters, Sonic the Hedgehog gracing this colorful new hardware. Now all handheld games aren't created equally mind you, and with that said, I was hesitant at first glance, but to my surprise, one strikingly unique quality about the Game Gear Sonic titles was that each one was a unique adventure. These weren't ports of the Sega Genesis titles, no, these titles fleshed out the already existing worlds of our Blue Hedgehog. With this in mind, the question I present to you all today is, was the 8-bit release of Sonic 1 a sequel to the original Sonic the Hedgehog on Genesis? Just how did this 8-bit rendition of Sonic 1 come to be? One year prior to the release of Sonic the Hedgehog, Sega decided to release its own portable handheld to compete with the likes of the Game Boy and various other portable systems at the time. However, around that time, the Sonic team began working around the clock on their brand new high-speed hedgehog endeavors. As Sonic was beginning to gain mainstream momentum, Sega thought it'd be a great idea to pump up the interest in this all-new Sega Game Gear by releasing an 8-bit portable version of Sonic 1 to coincide with this new hardware. Veteran composer Yuzo Koshiro, whom had recently signed on with Sega had recently been tasked with composing the soundtrack for the Genesis release of The Revenge of Shinobi. While working on the project, Koshiro mentioned interest in working on game development due to his prior experience working in the field. Sega witnessing Koshiro's skill set firsthand assigned him with the lead role developing the 8-bit Game Gear counterpart of Sonic 1. Due to legalities within his contract, Koshiro would go on to establish Ancient Corp. With this new founded company, Koshiro would go on to work on many more titles for Sega like Streets of Rage, Legend of Oasis, and Amazing Island. Fun fact, Koshiro would also go on to bring his family on board, having his sister serve as a primary director and his mother as supportive role behind the scenes. With this new team assembled, plans would go into motion. To begin, porting the original release of Sonic 1 to 8-bit hardware would be nearly impossible with hardware limitations at that time. With that in mind, the team would build their Sonic 1 from scratch with their own unique twist on it. This new version of Sonic 1 would be inspired by the core concepts of the original but would in large part be constructed with the team's own in-house ideas and creative takes, all while Sega would supervise the project throughout as our adventure began to take shape. Kushira, still being relatively new at Sega, would still have many challenges to overcome building his brand new Sonic from the ground up. After playing through this, I can confidently say the team did a fantastic job with it, placing a great deal of time and effort into the release, and it's one of the better Sonic games out there for the Game Gear. Now, let's touch on the music for a moment because there's a great deal of new zones and themes here. If Koshira didn't have enough on his plate already, the guy literally composed the 8-bit soundtrack as well. He initially started off by converting the Sega Genesis soundtrack using an 8-bit programmable sound generator. In the end, he would utilize only 3 tracks from the original score and would ultimately go on to create the rest of the soundtrack strictly from inspiration. This dude is a legit beast, and if you look at many of his other works, the guy has a great track record, with the musical score here being no exception. You can't deny the real feels you get from playing through Bridge Zone alone.
Now, the story of Sonic 8-Bit is in large part the same, taking place on South Island, yet here we dive a bit deeper into the island's inhabitants, diverging off the beaten path to explore the depths of the island's zones buried within. This, in many ways, is where I consider Sonic 8-Bit a spiritual sequel to its Genesis counterpart, and in many ways would also be interpreted as a retelling of the original story. The island is still home to the six mysterious Chaos Emeralds, with Eggman still hell-bent on searching out the emeralds to extract its power for his own technological gains, yet here he presents us with a new twist on many of his hellacious inventions designed to lay waste to Sonic and the many inhabitants of South Island. Some of these inventions are just as gimmicky as the last, yet his endgame strategy pans out completely differently. In Sonic 1, you embark on a journey across the island's various zones, destroying Eggman's badniks and putting an end to his newly constructed Scrap Brain. Here, Eggman develops a floating fortress high above the island which makes Scrap Brain look like child's play. So, looking ahead, what has truly changed this time around? What's been added and what's been stripped away to give us this 8-bit rendition of Sonic 1? Well, for starters, Sonic's traditional arsenal returns, granting him his now infamous maneuvers such as the spin jump and the supersonic spin attack. It is how you journey through the beautifully crafted zones where you discover the core gameplay is slightly altered, placing a heavier emphasis on the exploration and discovery. This is primarily due to the hardware limitations of the Sega Master System and Sega Game Gear respectively. With an 8-bit experience, what we get here is a bit more of a grounded Sonic. You won't find any loops or alternative pathways for travel throughout. Here, we stick to the basic side-scrolling platforming, but the primary way to gain more momentum is through the use of slopes, springboards, and ramps, with level design becoming significantly more straightforward in the overall approach. This can be seen on full display when searching out items and more importantly, the Chaos Emeralds. As the story goes, Sonic is in pursuit of the Chaos Emeralds, attempting to nab them before Robotnik can locate them and seize control. However, where Sonic 1 on the Genesis teleports you to special stages to seek out the Emeralds in the various Chaos Fields, our 8-bit journey utilizes its limitations cleverly, hiding the 6 Emeralds throughout the various zones one in each zone to be more specific, and as you progress, the sense of discovery only heightens as you attempt to leave no stone unturned. Seriously, it gets painfully difficult at times finding some of these and knowing you can't return later to recover them will make you pull your hair out of your head at times. Now, all isn't lost when it comes to the special stages. They do exist, however they do so the same way you enter special stages in Sonic 1 on Sega Genesis. After finishing a stage with 50 or more rings, you access a pinball inspired stage where you can continue to collect additional rings and grab continues along the way. Those 90s inspired CRT monitors make a smashing return still giving us the likes of the Power Shield, Smeed Sneakers, Invincibility, and so forth, what we have here are the arrow monitors now, granting you checkpoints similarly as the lampposts do in our Genesis counterpart. It's not anything groundbreaking, just more corners for Sonic to stir up as he dashes his way through a plethora of various goods. Now, I'd like to talk about the meat and potatoes of this game, what truly sets it apart from the original Sonic 1, and again begs the underlying question I present to you all. Is this a spiritual sequel to Sonic 1, or do you consider this something entirely unique altogether? Let's talk about these brand new zones, shall we? We open back at the beautifully lush, grassy terrains of Green Hill Zone, an iconic destination within South Island filled with palm trees and crumbling cliff sides throughout. This rendition of Green Hill Zone has seen a bit of an overhaul compared to its high-speed counterpart. Here, a great deal of the terrain is flat and void of the many high-speed loops and corkscrews scattered throughout previously. What we have here is a very level Green Hill, perhaps still in the regrowth phase from the previous war on Eggman. You can still manage to reach some crazy high speeds from time to time, and there are some excellent slope segments that will launch you to the outer limits. By Act 2, you will begin to explore the depths of the Green Hills themselves as you fall into the many interconnected tunnel systems throughout that the woodland inhabitants have appeared to have carved out and made their homes. These segments can be tricky to navigate through, but shouldn't give you much trouble as you progress. The stages are very short and simple throughout. Bridge Zone has you embark on a journey across the Great Lakes of South Island, seesawing your way to higher grounds. I love how the bridges behind you begin to slowly crumble beneath your feet and the red piranhas come chomping out from below the bridge, almost feeling like a homage to the earlier Super Mario Bridge stages. Bridge Zone is one of my personal favorites and I always look forward to the music and level design. Funny I say this because it's essentially an auto-scroller by Act 2, everything a classic Sonic act typically isn't. Jungle Zone, the second of our brand new zones to explore, finds us knee deep in the tropical terrains located in the center of South Island. 
This stage is beautifully decorated, packed with a fun variety of colorful fruit trees and waterfalls. Some of the most clever platforming segments are on display here, from the quirky back and forth log growing to the strategically placed vines buried throughout the upper tropical regions. The fight with robotting here can get out of hand if you aren't accustomed to rolling back and forth to mount the proper speed to launch yourself upwards for an attack on his egg craft. Labyrinth Zone brings us back to the stress inducing coral corridors buried in South Island's water temple. Everyone's favorite Sonic stage is back to give you another serving of that high anxiety, high pressure that makes you want to rage quit your run. However, this rendition of Labyrinth Zone isn't nearly as difficult and it might just be me, but the water physics aren't nearly as jarring to play through. It actually feels quite easy to journey throughout and this banger of an aquatic soundtrack gets me hyped up just enough to power through it. As we find our way through the aquatic ruins, we will eventually make our way to higher ground back at Eggman's Robotropolis, the Scrap Brain. Infiltrate Eggman's robotic courtyard, you travel your way back through his base of operations. Scrap Brain has seen a bit of an overhaul this time around, still coming equipped with all the mechanized gadgets such as torches, electric fields, and high speed assembly lines that will send you to an early death. As you journey further throughout, you will eventually get lost in a maze of pathways, following a precise sequence of hallways to find your way out. In the event you find the wrong exit, you're going back to the beginning of the stage. However, as you put Scrap Brain out of commission once again, things take a turn for the worse as Eggman waits patiently monitoring your every step. Eggman has learned from his previous run-in with the Blue Hedgehog. This time around, Eggman has a backup contingency plan. High above the mechanized scrapyard lies his metallic city above the clouds, the Sky Base. Without hesitation, Sonic manages to hitch a ride on Eggman's vessel as he follows in high pursuit. Sky Base Zone is no joke and quite literally stays true to its theme. This place is filled with construction girders and high electric fields that will make quick work out of our blue woodland friend. You travel the platforms, taking each step with caution, bobbing and weaving throughout the electric fields. It's a true endurance round. Just when you think you're in the clear, your journey into the heart of the sky base and you'll quickly be under fire again from the massive cannons that surveillance the area. This stretch is brutal and in my opinion just as hard if not more difficult as the Genesis rendition of Scrap Brain Act 3. It's a great endgame scenario. As Sonic continues to make his way through Eggman's mechanized battleship, he discovers a hidden room where Eggman waits. A room very similar to your final showdown with Eggman previously, but the level of severity has ramped up here with flames projecting up beneath you and electric orbs that quickly home in on our Hitchhog. You're continuing to attack the glass pod that houses Eggman and after a battle which feels to go on forever, you're eventually break through leaving you to have at it with Eggman. As Eggman's war machine continues to implode, you're given shade as the Mad Doctor attempts to flee through a teleporter. His destination set the Green Hill Zone. As Eggman quickly whisks off, Sonic mirrors his every move, entering through the teleporter before Eggman has the slightest chance of closing it. As the two dematerialize and rematerialize through space, they arrive at Green Hill with Eggman's ship conveniently parked out front for him to make his departure. Just before he can do so, Sonic appears making quick work of old Eggface, sending him packing once more. Depending if you collect all of the Chaos Emeralds, Emeralds will determine the fate of your adventure. Upon collecting all 6 Chaos Emeralds, Sonic will release the Emeralds again back into the ether, this time wiping away the destruction caused by Eggman, closing out our story. The 8-bit Sonic 1 experience is pretty solid overall. I would recommend it to anyone that's a die-hard Sonic fan. It was Sega's first crack at the 8-bit formula, and to be honest, Ancient did a great job here delivering a charming little experience. It's a simple pick up and play Sonic game that I can easily blow through if I have an hour or so to spare. You won't find broken or misplaced stage hazards to artificially make the experience difficult and efforts to prolong the gameplay. Bridge Zone is always a treat to play through. From its catchy little melody to its simplistic design choice, Jungle Zone was a great addition that gave us some quirky new gimmicks and additionally fleshed out the South Island adventure that much more. Outside the hunt for the Chaos Emeralds, the stages never felt like they overstayed their welcome or had painfully difficult segments. Really outside me running around finding a way out of Scrap Brain's new maze, I had a great time time exploring for the Chaos Emeralds. The true test towards the end was finding a way to time my jumps accordingly to avoid the electrical currents throughout Skybase. Trust me, I failed many times here, but I never really felt cheated. Sonic 1 is by no means groundbreaking in design, so don't go into this with high expectations. It's more so a game I recommend for someone wanting a simple, straightforward, classic platforming experience. This is one that's easy to pick up and play, and every diehard Sonic fan should give it a go at some point. As I mentioned, there are a few 
few bad Game Gear games, which we will get into in time, but this isn't one of them. It's a fun little experience you should undoubtedly try at some point just for the fun of it. With that said, we now continue forward with the Sonic Marathon. Okay, so that's Sonic 8-Bit. I wouldn't really call it a sequel, but I did enjoy it. So, can I have my game back? Hmm, I suppose. I guess you should play through Sonic 2 next. Sonic 2 on Master System? No, no, no. You said Sonic 2, right? Sonic 2 on Master System. 